This is the third video in a series about what it would take to add a floppy disk drive to an early Altair. Back in the days before MITS or any other companies were offering floppy disk drives for these early computers. Now in the first video, we took a look at the hardware, we looked at the boards that were going to be in our Altair, and then we also took a look at the floppy drive we we're going to use and how those two connected to each other. Then in the second video, we wrote a piece of software to let us test the drive. We proved that we could seek to any track and that we could read and write a sector that we chose. Now with all that in place, here in this third video, we can finally start working on the original problem we set out to solve. And that is how do we get a floppy drive to work with the MITS programming system? Uh, the programming system is a assembly language software development environment for the early Altair that used only paper tape or cassette for mass storage because that's all that existed at the time. And as you can imagine, and as I've shown in other videos, trying to use editors and assemblers when your mass storage is a 300 baud cassette or 110 baud paper tape is pretty miserable. It's slow, not very reliable. And if you're trying to do any sort of serious software development, it just really isn't feasible. And as mentioned in our first video, our plan is to do serious software development. And so we need to make a better development environment out of our early Altair. Best way to do that was to add a floppy. So we've taken on that task on our, ourselves. So now the question is, how would you integrate the floppy into the software development system? The most logical approach would probably be to continue to use the byte stream style of IO that the, um, the software development system uses. That would essentially treat your floppy drive as, as, it, as if it were a high-speed cassette or a high-speed paper tape reader and punch. And that certainly may be where we end up with this. However, as I worked on the software for the uh, testing the drive in the last video, I realized there's a very short detour that we can take that will very quickly let us take advantage of the speed of the floppy drive. So that's what we're going to look at today so that we can more quickly get using this floppy drive, even though it may not be the final product, it'll allow the whole development effort to go quicker. So let's do a video get cut and get that software up and loaded. All right, so as in the other video, to save some time, I've already got the uh, programming system completely up and loaded, and I have our source file in here. Again, it's about a 10 minute process, multiple steps. You have to load the monitor, then you load the editor, then you load the assembler, then you use the assembler to load your source file, and a couple of parameters you set along the way, and then at that point, now we are ready to edit and assemble all in memory over and over and over as we need to, hoping that the system, of course, doesn't crash and clobber what we've done. Now what I noticed is that this 10 minute process is really doing nothing more than loading our 16K of RAM with the exact data we need. If I were to take and write this 16K of RAM out to the floppy disk drive, it takes about five tracks, then I could load those five tracks in anytime I wanted and instantly be back to this spot. I mean the load and the read would take three or four seconds compared to 10 minutes and it'd be one simple step. Even all the parameters we had to set where we had to poke in the end and start an end address of the edit buffer and things like that, that would already be done for us because it's already in RAM. So consider it a workspace. I can load and save the workspace as needed. And that workspace includes the source file. So I don't even have to do the step of saving the source file out periodically. Anytime I save the workspace, I've saved the source file. So now saving the source file takes two or three seconds instead of several minutes. So this is a great way to get us up and running quickly. And I was going to take a look at this here with you today. And you'll also see that the software is extremely simple given the test program that we wrote last week as our starting point, because that has basically our disk drivers in it. It has our track seek. It has our sector read and write routines. So really all I have to do is take last week's program, change the main loop where I prompted the human for a track to read and a sector to read or write and just put in a loop that writes out a read 16K. So that's what we're gonna look at here. Zoom in a bit. Okay, so as before, we'll go into the editor. R means re-edit. And so here's the start of the main loop where last week we prompted for the drive, the track, and the sector to read. I've started with a a jump table. We're going to probably want a jump table going forward as we add new features. This way the entry address for all the features we're adding will be at common locations. 
So I've put two in here, load workspace and save workspace for now. Load would be where we'll jump to boot. Anytime we want to load a workspace from a cold start, we will jump there. Of course, after we put this in prom, or just while you're running, you can always jump to this location and reload. And then three bytes above that, because each jump is three bytes, would be the, the uh, entry point to save it. All right, so these two jump to these two entry points, and all that does is save a read or a write as what we're going to execute down here in the transfer routine. So I use a common routine for both reading and writing. All right, and the transfer is a very simple loop. Basically, we start at address zero and track zero, and then we either read or write, increment the track by run, decrement the number of tracks, and then we're done. So that's really all there is to the main outer loop. It's, it's five tracks all together. And then here is the transfer track routine. This is either gonna read or write. So we start at sector one, and you'll notice that I'm adding two sectors each time, increment sector by two. As I mentioned, we can't read and write consecutive sectors, but every other sector we can. So I write or read one, three, five, seven, nine, up through 25, and then two, four, six, eight, up through 26. So it takes two track rotations, um, two disk revolutions to read or write all 26 sectors. It takes about a little over three tenths of a second. Now, if I were just to write consecutive sectors one through 26, then when I come back to write the next sector, I'll have always missed it and have to wait a full revolution for it to come back around. So it would take 26 revolutions to read or write a track. That's about four and a half seconds. So by doing this every other sector, we're literally better than 10 times faster. And that's it. We're down here to the read sector routine. That's the same routine that was in our, uh, our test module that we wrote in our last video. So the rest of this is the same. It's just that simple loop at the top. And now we've got something that can read or write out 16K. All right, so let's go ahead and run the editor, I mean the assembler. And again, if I type file, it takes it from the file source, which I have pointed to the edit buffer. So this is all in RAM. It takes five or six seconds, which is not bad at all. Now again, this is just a heading of the undefined symbols that will follow. None of them follow, so everything's good. All right, I assembled this program at uh, 3C100. However, the jump commands are all in octal. Um, let me insert the disk. All right, so to write, I'll jump. Our table's at 36,000. And of course, oops, that's not backspace. I gotta remember. Let's see here, what's that gonna do? All right, good. Uh, delete is delete, not backspace. So jump 36,003, whoops, three. When I press delete, that's the underscore comes out. All right, so this is jumping to 36,003, which will be the right routine. So that took less than three seconds altogether, and that wrote out that 16K. All right, let's go ahead and uh, go into the editor. See, if I do it with R, you can see I have the editor content. But if I do EDT, now it says bad line number because it's empty. What I want to do is prove that we actually are reading this back in. So let's zoom out a bit here so we can see the disk drive. All right, and now we'll jump to the read entry point, which is 36,000. And we're back. Let's go back into the editor now. Oops, I could type. And there's our source file back. All right, so um, now this is exciting. If, if I now put this into prom, I can boot a cold machine in a matter of a few seconds. Anytime I want to save the file I'm working on, I just jump to the right routine and it's all saved along with anything else I've been doing. I mean, just a, a world of difference compared to what we have. So now all we have to do is get this into prom. Um, I'll probably put it into the first locations on that prom board I showed you, and I'll pull it out and um, put those proms in. Now we're at 3C100 right now. That prom would be at F800, so I'm gonna have to change that. So let me, let's do a replace on line seven, and the new org will be F800.
All right, so now this will put it up into the prompt for us. Now, the problem we have, though, is that this is a one-pass in-memory assembly. It actually has to write the code into memory somewhere in order to build it and resolve all references, uh, forward references. So we have no memory up at F800, that's where our prompt card is. So the developers of the programming system knew this could be an issue, so they added another directive called the ORR, which I believe stands for org and RAM. So this org is where you're actually going to assemble it for execution, however where you put it during the assembly process can be at a different address. So let's insert that after 7, and we'll just leave that at the 3C100. Okay, so we're assembling for execution at F800, but it will build it in RAM at 3C100 where we had it before. So now I can assemble it. That's it. So now in RAM at 3C100 is the program, but it's not executable at 3C100 because it's actually assembled as to run at F800. But at this point, now I can connect my PROM programmer and write it from the 3C100 address out to the PROM programmer and then put it into our PMC board and boot. Now you might wonder how do you actually program this? Well there are several ways back in the days. MITS actually had a PROM programmer that uh, you could write from one area of RAM out to the programmer which would work fine here or you could write a simple program here to punch this out to a paper tape send it off to Intel who would punch, I mean, who would burn prompts for you at a nominal fee, or even MITS. I could do a dump command here to cassette, send the cassette to MITS, and they would burn prompts for you if you wanted. But I've got a prompt programmer, so I'm gonna go put this onto some EPROMs, and then at that point, we can boot and save um, at power on without having to load anything. And suddenly our 10 minute load is now down to just a few seconds. So this would be a, a huge game changer. All right, so I've opened up the computer and pulled out the prom card, and I've burnt two new proms and have those installed over here on the far left. It was a little over 256 bytes, so it took up two proms. By the time we're all said and done, we may be into two or even three proms. Again, each of these proms is just 100, uh, excuse me, 256 bytes, 100 hex bytes. So anyway, those are starting down there. The far left prom is at F800. And so when we want to boot, we'll jump there. That's where the jump table is. F800 will be the code to read the workspace or boot. And F803 will be the code that would write it back out. All right, so let me put this back together again, and then uh, we'll give it a whirl. All right, with our boot ROMs installed on the 88 PMC board inside the computer, and our workspace saved over on that disk, now we can boot with this new technique. Let's compare it to the 10 minutes it takes from cassette. Turn on the computer, give it a reset, examine the start address, which will be F800. That's where we started our prom. We turn on the computer, insert the disk. Now all we have to do is hit run, and you'll see over here on the computer, I mean on the disk drive, you'll see the activity. All right, and it's up and running. That's all it took. Compare that to the 10 minute process we've described before and you can see what an absolute dream this is in comparison. Go into the editor, the file we've been working on is there and we can just pick up where we lost, where we left. All right, so before uh, this was assembled at 3C100 when we had it in RAM, now that it's in ROM, we're up at F800. So instead of jumping to 36,000 in Octal, now we're jumping to 174000. So the save is 174003, of course, because that's the jump entry address for save. So that right there is doing a save, and that's done. And to 174000 would be the load. All right, now it'd be very nice not to have to type those addresses in order to load or save. And that's actually very easy to do. As you've noticed, Here's a command called JMP. We've seen EDT for edit, AM2 for the assembler. Those are all actually just programs in memory. They just happen to have a name assigned to them in the monitor's jump table or program table. Well, in assembly, you can write a program and have it put into that same um, program table. So let's put in an entry for load and save and just make this easier. We can then save that with our workspace, then we'll have those commands. 
So let's go into the editor. Now the editor does not have to take input from a file. Anything I type here as if, um, is a direct command, as if I had put it in a file and then used the file directive. So the beginning directive tells the assembler what is the starting address of the program you're working on. So let's go ahead and do the, the load first of all. That's at 0F800. So the load begins there. And then to tell the program, to tell the assembler to put an entry into the program table, you use the run command and give it a name. So this is our load routine at F800. Now, unfortunately, it actually is going to run the program at this point. There's no way to tell it just to put it in. So I'm going to eject the disk so that it won't actually load the disk. Otherwise, that will undo what we're modifying in memory here. So we'll get a disk error here. That's that DE that came from our own prompts because the, the drive wasn't ready. But that did create the load program in the program table. Now let's do the exact same thing for the save. We'll do the begin for that is at F803. And we'll call that save. Again, that'll get a disk error as well. Now I'm going to insert the disk. All right, now I'll do a save. And now that's on disk. And load, we'll read it back in. So now th this, is, this is super slick. I'm going to go ahead and just do a complete reboot. So I'm going to reset, examine F800, and run. Okay, so I've done a reboot. We're back at the command prompt. And you can see we have our file in here still. And if I wanted to save anything I was doing, I just type save. And it's saving it. And if I want to start back over something, you know, undo basically, I can just type load. And so at this point, I can boot in a couple seconds. I can load and save just by typing those commands. This is a whole new world, and the rest of our development will be dramatically faster. All right, well, that'll do it for this video. In the next video, we're going to see um, more of what we're going to do for the final product, so to speak, for this as we try to integrate this floppy drive into the MITS programming system.